Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to QI Connect from a sunny but cold Scotland. A number of us have had our first flurry of snow today. So this is our fifth session of 2022, and it's the 73rd session since we began. And I'm Ruth Glassborough, your QI Connect chair for today. QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health and social care and beyond to learn from international leaders in the fields of improvement, innovation and integration. So welcome to QI Connect. I'm going to hand over now to Michael Canavan, who is going to take us through some housekeeping. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, Ruth. And those of you who are familiar with QI Connect will be familiar with these housekeeping notes, but just in case there are any new people on the call today, please use the Q&A function to submit any questions you have for our guest speaker. The session is being recorded and by taking part, you can send to this. In the event of any technical issues at our end, please just bear with us and we'll, we'll work hard to bring the session back at the earliest opportunity. The recording of the session and any resources covered will be made available following today's session. Just a wee note on how to use the Q&A function. So on the top right of your screen, you should see the Q&A tab. Just submit your questions via the Q&A tab. These won't appear immediately. We, we moderate the questions just to minimise any duplication of questions or themes. So they may take a moment or two to show up on your featured questions. Please like your favourite questions. Upvoting those questions will make them very visible to the chair so that the chair can see the, the most popular questions to then pose to our guest speaker today. Thank you very much and I'll hand you back to Ruth. Thank you, Michael. So including staff across health and care services in Scotland, um, we've had nearly five and a half thousand participants join our sessions in the last year from a total of 27 different countries. And since QI Connect started, we've had engagement from approximately 1300 organisations, including 89 universities and colleges. I know a number of you uh, watch this back. Uh, on, on the um, recording. So hello to everyone as well who is watching us on the recording. So delivering QI Connect is very much a team effort. Um, and I always say this, what an amazing team it is. They do a fantastic job behind the scenes. So just to call out to all of them, thank you. And also a thanks to NHS Scotland's National Video Conferencing Service. They continue to provide us with excellent support for MSS Teams live events. And also please do remember to tweet as you learn. You can use the QI Connect hashtag and tag in our account. That would be great. And if you aren't already following us, please do give us a follow. So I am absolutely delighted today to introduce our guest speaker, Kedar Mate, President and Chief Executive Officer at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. We consider him a friend of our work here in Scotland, not the least the invaluable input he provided to the work in Scotland on value management. Thank you. He has long been a significant leader in the world of quality improvement and his credentials are long and impressive and far too long to go through all of them. But just a highlight um, includes a body of scholarly work around health system design, healthcare quality, strategies for achieving large scale change and approaches to improve in value. He has numerous honours, including serving as a Soros Fellow, a Fulbright Specialist and an Aspen Institute Innovations Fellow. And his academic career, interestingly, started with a degree in American history from Brown University before he then went on to obtain his medical degree from the prestigious Harvard Medical School. In his current role, he is promoting a much needed focus on issues of inequity. And part prior to COVID, the inequalities gaps were growing here in Scotland. And the last two years have further exacerbated that. And we know that our current economic context is sadly, to my, uh, sadly likely to make it even worse. 
and hence it has never been as important as it is now to ensure an inequalities focus in all our quality improvement work. And KDAR is someone who has lived and breathed a focus on addressing the issues of inequity from the very beginning of his career, where he worked for Partners in Health, helping a team in Peru implement a treatment programme for patients with drug resistance tuberculosis in an urban slum outside Lima. So he joins us today off the back of an extremely successful IHI forum where it was clear from Twitter that this focus on inequity was threaded throughout. And today we have the wonderful opportunity to hear more about his thinking on this critical issue. And having had a sneak peek at his slides, I know you're not going to be disappointed. So Kedar, it is with great pleasure that I now hand over to you. Wow, well, uh... Ruth, thank you so much for that unbelievable introduction. Uh, I hope I can't disappoint you now. This is a, it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to join all of you. Let me just check a couple of things before we get going here. Can you see my slides and can you see and hear me OK? Yes, OK, I see the thumbs up. So with that, let me get started. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be part of this conversation. I'm excited to be with you. Uh, I'm really grateful to the organizers uh, for not putting me up against uh, a World Cup quarterfinal game. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to take a moment to speak to this global community. Uh, of course, uh, a group uh, I know from Scotland who we've been partnered with for now going on our second decade or longer. It's been a thrill to work with uh, the, the health system in Scotland for IHI, uh, a strategic partner of IHIs for so many years, and truly a, a pathfinder, a groundbreaker um, in so many different dimensions of quality and healthcare improvement. So it's a real privilege to be part of this conversation, and I thank you for your time. I know this is a difficult time for so many of you um, in the health sectors uh, across the world, so I thank you for your time, for your work, and for your trust and your courage uh, during these extraordinarily challenging moments all across the globe. Uh, let me just say right at the beginning, I'm going to offer you a number of stories here about inequity, about challenges to our workforce, and uh, I'm going to address them from the lens that I know the best. I, as you can tell from my voice and uh, my accent, I am uh, American. I, I uh, am of Indian origin, uh, but my my home is, is in the United States, um, and I have been here for many years. Uh, as Ruth mentioned, I trained here and I practice medicine here in the U.S., so I'm going to speak about healthcare um, and its challenges and the challenges to our workforce and inequity from an American lens. But I believe the issues that we are grappling with today are truly universal, are truly global in nature. So uh, with that heavy caveat and your permission and grace, let me start with a, a brief story. About six months ago, I was at a uh, what is sometimes known as a uh, a soccer match here in the US, but I know you all call it football. So I was at a football match and I was watching my son and his, um, my nine year old son, Bodhi, that's him next to the referee there, uh, miles away from where the action actually is taking place with the ball. But I was watching my son and all of his uh, friends and colleagues uh, trying to figure out how to pass the ball to each other and, and get it into the goal. It was a, a gorgeous, a beautiful late spring Saturday morning. And I was on the sideline, as you can see from this picture, uh, taking pictures with my phone. And uh, suddenly my phone dinged with a text message. Uh, this one was from Donald Berwick. Uh, many of you know Don uh, as the uh, one of the inspirational founders of the quality movement in healthcare. Uh, Don is, of course, the founder of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, where I now work. And uh, here in the US, Don led the largest public insurance program, Medicare and Medicaid. Don and I have worked together for decades, two decades now. And one of the things I love about Don is that he almost never texts me on a Saturday morning. Um, but this message was too urgent. His message read in the text message, we have much to do to achieve real healing. See your email. I dutifully went to my email and found that Don had forwarded me a note from a colleague uh, of his, Dr. Claudia Finkelstein. Uh, Claudia is a faculty member at the University of Washington in Seattle. I didn't know Claudia at the time. I didn't know her uh, uh, except through the text that uh, Don was sending me. But I've since learned that Claudia has spent a 30-year career in medicine as an internal medicine physician 
a medical educator, and a hospital administrator. Claudia's note started ominously. Tuesday at the podium in a small auditorium, I realized my time was finally up. This, I wanna to read to you now just for a moment, the rest of Claudia's note, which, which stunned me at the, on that Saturday morning. Early on, Claudia wrote, my work's purpose, the meaning in my work and the love were easy to access. The rewards of my work easily outweighed the inevitable stresses of a clinical life. The ability to connect deeply to people, to alleviate suffering in both patients and the people that I was training was more than adequate compensation for the difficulties of the work itself. I was sure my patients could tell I cared about them and for them. Uh, but along the way, something changed. I didn't notice when the indifference started to crowd out the love and the joy for my work. But now there's no mistaking it. What's happened, Claudia wondered. The cause is murky, some nature, some nurture. The political, societal, and economic changes to how we practice medicine and how we provide care were part of it. But increasingly, Claudia wrote, my inability to address social inequities as the root causes of many primary care visits created moral distress and a sense of being powerless. I felt like I was peddling amlodipine and Prozac to people who needed a proper living wage and an even playing field. It became more and more difficult to believe, Claudia writes, that I was actually helping people. It may be that I have not been up to the task of making things better, Claudia said. It may be that I no longer relish connecting to individual trainees or patients. Maybe I've just run out of steam and compassion. The letter ended, as I have read it to you here, as just as it's uh, as abruptly in some ways as it started. And I remember thinking at the time how how disturbing it was. A shiver ran down my spine as I was standing there on that crisp Saturday morning. In medicine, those of you that are in medicine, we are trained to look for cries for help. This, Claudia's letter, was a cry for help, no doubt about it, but not just from an individual, I would argue. It was a cry for help from the healing professions as a whole. As I thought about Claudia's letter, I kept coming back to one particular sentence. It was this one. My inability to address social inequities created moral distress and a sense of powerlessness. I felt that I'd heard this exact notion just recently, just recently. My father has been a small town community pediatrician in my hometown in New Jersey for over 50 years. The kind of doctor who can't get through a grocery store without running into his patients in every aisle. It takes him hours to get through a grocery store. My father's resisted calls to retire, even as all of his friends have knocked off to play golf or travel around the world. But just two weeks before I read Claudia's note, my dad called me to tell me that he'd had it. He was hanging up his stethoscope. His practice had been bought two years earlier by a large group practice consortium, and they were finally not happy with his productivity. He had been used to deciding how long to spend with his patients and their train and his trainees. He wanted to hear his patient stories, their real stories on his schedule. And what he wanted above all was to do whatever it took to help. His new bosses wanted shorter visits and more immunizations. His style of doctoring, how he helped people get healthy, was out of sync with the new care model. And so he, like Claudia, was planning to get out. Back in the 1980s, ethicist and philosopher Andrew Jameson, in describing the pressures on the nursing professions, helped to frame the distinctions between moral uncertainty, where the moral course of action is unknown, moral dilemmas, where a choice is present between two or more ethically justifiable actions, and moral distress, where nurses were asked to do things that went against their conscience. When a lot of these kinds of moments of moral distress came about, they would result in lasting and potentially permanent moral injuries. Reading Claudia's note reminded me of discussions I'd had with my wife, who is a palliative care physician, an infectious disease doctor, and a hospital ethicist. We never thought all three of her talents would ever be used simultaneously. 
But there we were, like we were with all of you in March of 2020, people dying horrific deaths from an infectious disease that every day presented us as clinicians with ethical conundrums. In those early days, we would talk, my wife and I, about the impossible choices she was having to make, horrible choices like who to give ICU beds to, how to divvy up the precious ventilators that were present in our hospitals, what care should be delayed or permanently put on hold, horrible mind-bending choices that graded against her oaths and her obligations to heal. When she left clinical practice at the beginning of this year, I asked her if she felt burnt out. She refused the label. That's not how I feel, she told me. When I asked her about moral injury, this notion of the system not allowing her to do the things that she wanted to do, the glove fit perfectly. Our impossible choices felt new and different during the pandemic, and yet they were also very familiar. For years, we've been making these kinds of choices in healthcare. Every day in hospitals all over the world, we, uh, we force suicidal adults or teenagers to wait in emergency departments for days on end with nowhere to send them. We place our older adults in decaying care homes that are understaffed and under-resourced. We allow unconscious biases to under-treat pain and hemorrhage in our Black and Indigenous mothers. And we force our poorest and most vulnerable patients to travel the longest distances because there is no quality health care in their communities. In the US healthcare, in my country, healthcare regularly confiscates, confiscates the funds we set aside to educate our children, care for our elderly, and provide options for our poor. There's a lot written about burnout these days. Global surveys suggest that one in three clinicians are considering leaving their jobs. In the US, one in five healthcare workers have already quit or changed their uh, jobs, and a quarter want to leave healthcare altogether. Organizations have invested in wellness programs and other efforts to bolster resilience, yoga, personal restoration, exercise schemes, food, food, uh, you know, food parties. More mature programs offer mental health services for our healthcare workers, increases in pay, more time to execute non-clinical tasks. None of these things are wrong or bad, but the pressures on our system and our people are too great, and these fixes are far too superficial. What's more, I believe they fundamentally miss the diagnosis. In a survey of over 5,000 clinicians in, in the US, Colin West and colleagues from the Mayo Clinic found that physicians and nurses don't lack resilience. In fact, Professor West proved what so many of you on the line today already know. In general, healthcare professionals, healthcare professionals are more resilient than the overall public. And yet, despite that resilience, our colleagues were and are experiencing unprecedented rates of burnout. What exactly is going on? The problem, I believe, isn't the resilience of healthcare workers. The fault is baked into our systems. Dr. Wendy Dean, a colleague and friend, of, is a psychiatrist and surgeon in Boston. And uh, Dr. Dean and her colleagues, uh, Simon Talbot, have worked for many years with Army veterans and survivors of conflict zones. She recently founded the organization that you see here on the screen, Moral Injury in Healthcare, which focuses on helping healthcare workers. Wendy said in a conversation we had recently, there are a lot of roads that lead to burnout, but the highway to burnout is moral injury. In a recent discussion, Wendy said, training individual resilience assumes individual frailty, but moral injury is a systems problem. To use an analogy, we have a healthcare workforce full of high performance Lamborghinis. We ask them to drive on roads full of potholes and fallen trees. To let the Lamborghinis perform to their full potential, to let them drive at top speed, we need to fix the potholes and clear the trees. So how do we do that? Where do we begin to fix the potholes and change our health systems? I believe that Claudia offered us a clue in the letter she wrote. She wrote again, my inability to address social inequities created moral distress and a sense of powerlessness. The causes of Claudia's distress were not random. They were very specific. In a conversation with her, she told me 
a story after story of patients whose wounds were not just physical but social and whose risk was compounded by their life circumstances. We spoke about a patient midway through breast cancer treatment who lost her health insurance during the pandemic and didn't complete her care. Individuals who became food insecure lost the ability to get healthy foods as families lost their jobs. We spoke about adolescents who were increasingly anxious, depressed, even suicidal, for whom the only options were expensive mental health services that were out of reach. But more than anything, we spoke about the social circumstances of our patients, unstable housing, weakened safety nets, lack of family support, conditions that disproportionately affect populations that have been chronically under-resourced and chronically under-supported. For these patients, Claudia spoke about the frustration of prescribing medications that she knew her patients could never afford and that would never cure the true causes of their suffering. But here, I believe, lies an opportunity for all of us and perhaps a way through the fog of moral injury. I had always imagined, I'd always believed that if we work to improve health equity, we would improve the lives of those who we provided care for, the patients, the families, the communities. But what I didn't realize until I spoke with Claudia and read her note was that working on equity would be healing for us as healers. So let's talk about inequities for a moment. I expect that in your countries, you will have different definitions of what it means to have uh, health inequality or health inequity. There are many definitions of inequity. I, I use this one from the Centers for Disease Control here in the United States. They define health inequity as this, a difference or disparity in health outcome that is systematic, avoidable, and unjust. And the reason I like this definition, there are two reasons. One, because it involves the notion of justice in the definition, which I believe is central to what causes inequity. And the second reason I like it is that because of the work that we do together as a community of quality improvers, systems thinkers, and patient safety experts, in our line of work, inequities are examples of variation, unwanted variation, variation that is systematic, avoidable, and unjust. And just as we have with so many other kinds of variations, we know how to eliminate this kind of variation. And we know variation is costly to our systems and societies, both in real dollars and more importantly, in real lives of patients and our staff. Inequities are variation. There's no question about it. A special kind of variation driven by multiple histories that are different from one country to the next of oppression and structured injustice. Your country will have a different story of inequity than mine. They're so embedded that we often don't even know that they're there, these inequities. We believe we apply all of our reliable care processes exactly the same for everyone. We think we do it, but do we do it? And do we have the courage to look at the data, what the data actually tells us? Because when we look at the data, we find inequities in almost every aspect of society. Here are data from the United States across healthcare, education, criminal justice, child welfare, and economic indicators from our friends at the Groundwater Institute. These data show that compared to white people in, in the United States, white folks, Black Americans, Native Americans, and Hispanic Americans experience significantly worse outcomes across every measure. The relative risk of an infant, a baby dying, a Black baby dying, is two and a half times greater than compared to a white infant. The risk of incarceration for a black person in the United States is five times greater across the whole country. For Native Americans, the need for foster care is three and a half times greater. In some Southern states, the risk of an adverse outcome, the relative risk of a bad outcome can be up to 10 times worse for black Americans compared to white Americans. But lest we think this is a problem of only Southern states or only part of your country, here are data from liberal progressive Massachusetts where IHI is based. We believe the Northeast to be a place where these kinds of things don't happen. They happen. Inequities exist everywhere. It was, it was five years ago that I first heard this story, and I want to just tell you the story briefly here today because it's one that deserves to be retold. Dr. Shalon Irving, at 36 years of age, 
had been one of us. She was an epidemiologist, a lieutenant commander in the Centers for Disease Control's Epidemic Intelligence Service. She worked on infection control. She worked on the Zika pandemic in multiple countries around the world. She worked on HIV. She worked on a number of different infectious diseases. She had studied inequity in those contexts across the world. She had studied lack of access to healthcare. She has studied how generational trauma led to adverse outcomes. In April 2016, Shalon, who had been hoping to become pregnant for over a year, learned that she finally was. She was overjoyed. She wrote to a friend who was also pregnant at the time. Let's finally go for our rainbows and unicorns, she wrote. She bought a crib, as seen here. She painted a room. She chose a name for her baby, like all of us do. Shalon weathered the physical challenges of pregnancy. Her blood pressure rose a few times, but always fell back to normal. But still, at 37 weeks, it was time for her daughter, Soleil, Sunny, as she would be known, to be born. This was a moment of pure joy. A moment shared across three generations, pictured here in the photograph on the left. Shalon, Soleil, and her and her mother, so Shalon's mother, Wanda. Three generations in that in that photograph, and Soleil there on the right. The holes in the Swiss cheese began to terrifyingly align in the postpartum period. A familial clotting disorder that Shalon had in her family, a small incisional abscess that drained for much longer than it should have after a cesarean section, asymmetric swollen legs, multiple occasions upon which Shalon's blood pressure rose from 130 over 85 to 158 over 112 to 174 over 118. Emergency workups should have been initiated, but they never happened. And most critically, Shalon's own feeling, there is something wrong here, she told so many of us. And the words of her friends and her mother were dismissed over and over and over again. On January 28th, three weeks after giving birth to Soleil or Sunny, Shalon Irving, the public health researcher, equity champion, and recent mother, died a completely reversible death. Shalon and I have a mutual friend in Reagan McDonald Mosley, a, a colleague of ours, an obstetrician, a gynecologist. She's the CEO of Power to Decide, a, a reproductive health organization here in the US. Reagan um, looked at Shalon's charts after her death. And Reagan, I remember saying, Shalon was highly educated, well insured, well resourced, well connected to all of us. If this can happen to Shalon, it can happen to anyone. Wanda Irving, Shalon's mother, now lives in Atlanta and is the full-time caretaker of, of, of Sunny and a full-time advocate for ending maternal death in Black women. She started a nonprofit, Dr. Shalon's Maternal Action Project, that is dedicated to this mission. Wanda says, I face my granddaughter, now five, every single day. And she's still asking, where is her mother? And why isn't her mother there? That doesn't make any sense. Why she has to go through that kind of pain, Wanda says. We cannot let this continue to happen. Health inequities cause massive clinical harm, and they cost us and our societies dearly. By some estimates, every year we waste $320 billion here in the US due to our in inattention to health equity. For perspective, we waste more money on health inequities than the federal government here in the United States spends on housing, public housing and public education combined. By 2040, health inequities are projected to cost our country, my country, over a trillion dollars. As my colleague and mentor, Dr. Mark Smith likes to say, if you don't believe inequities cause harm, you haven't been paying attention. And here's the thing, inequities like these don't just harm black people or poor people or transgender people, they are harmful to every one of us. Here are data recently uh, from a slide from the Commonwealth Fund from, the, from literally a week ago on maternal mortality across 13 of the most developed countries in the world. Many of you are probably from these countries. My country, the United States, rates dead last on this measure by a wide margin. More women die in childbirth in America than in any other wealthy nation. Many of you are maybe familiar with the fact that for black women in America like Shalon, 
the risk of death is four times higher than the nearest other nation. But here's the thing. Look at the data for white Hispanic white women and Hispanic women as well. These are white American women and Hispanic American women. On their own, white American women and Hispanic American women have the worst maternal mortality of any industrialized nation in the world. The truth is the deeply inequitable care system we have is actually not working for anyone in our country. I don't want to uh, intimate to all of you that this is all doom and gloom. This is all depression. There is some good news amidst all this tragedy. The work that you do, quality improvement and safety science, meth is now widely understood in healthcare that all of you know and apply in your lives and your work. These methods are designed to identify and eliminate undesired variation from our systems. And the evidence is mounting from all corners of our country and all corners of the world that applying quality improvement methods to inequities can work. Here's an article from the New England Journal of Medicine from our partners at Rush University Medical Center. Rush has been working with IHI for years now on these issues. After a black woman in Chicago with breast cancer was misdiagnosed, suffered poor coordination of care, she almost underwent a wrong site mastectectomy. After those three errors took place, Rush began a process of self-reflection, collaboration with other health systems in Chicago, and systematic quality improvement that led to earlier diagnosis of breast cancer among black patients, earlier intervention and treatment, and these effects have reduced the racial disparity in breast cancer mortality in Chicago by 20% a result not seen in other comparable American cities. Another example, for years, Fran Gans Lord and Kene Johnson have led improvement in Montefiore in the Bronx in New York City with remarkable success. They, for example, reduced delays in MRI care, MRI start times by 33%. They cut it by a third in less than six months by providing patients with parking vouchers for the valet. But as you can imagine, this didn't improve delays for people who didn't have cars. So those that took two buses and a train to get to Montefiore in the Bronx, for them it widened the disparity and created even more delays. Reflecting on this, Fran and Kine rebuilt every QI tool that they have in their, in their, in their toolkit. Here's a fishbone diagram. That fishbone diagram now includes a tail to consider demography and social determinants, driver diagrams, now ask for data stratification. PDSA now asks questions on the form itself about whether the effect of the improvement is equitably distributed. The effects of these changes to QI tools are already being seen in everything that Kine and Fran do, from improving heart failure care to reducing or improving flow through the hospital. One last story. Some years ago, IHI began working with the emergency room clinicians at a large health system in the Pacific Northwest. They observed a dramatic inequity in their stroke care protocol. Here's their stroke care pro protocol. When a black and white patient presented to one of the ERs with signs and symptoms of a stroke, the time from door to life-saving, clot-busting medications, thrombolytics, was 20 minutes longer for, for a black patient, or 70% more delayed compared to white patients. Time is brain, and delays like this increase the risk of morbidity, disability, even death. The initial reaction from the emergency room doctors and nurses was predictable. They questioned the truthfulness of the data. They wondered about whether it was real or not. They denied it. They cast blame. They looked for blame. But ultimately, as with every other health quality initiative or health equity related improvement initiative I've ever seen, these clinicians ultimately came around to see the need to do something. And once they did, they applied themselves in discipline, quality improvement cycles, PDSAs. They standardized their stroke assessment. They improved time to critical orders. They reduced delays in the pharmacy. And ultimately, they eliminated this disparity completely. And what was striking about this was that it happened not in a single site, but across their whole system. And even more, this transformation did not take decades or years, but it was achieved in 11 weeks. They eliminated this inequity again in 11 weeks. Too often we get trapped, I think, in our sense that these inequities are impervious to change. We cannot change them. That racism, sexism, homophobia are so structurally embedded 
that to tackle them is beyond our scope of practice as clinicians. But here is an example. What you see on your screen is an example of how clinical teams and quality leaders in healthcare today, equipped with the knowledge and tools to make effective changes and change the story, can undo these structural challenges that have long plagued our societies and our communities. I don't want to for a moment say that this will be easy. It won't be. But I also think it's crucial for us to change the narrative around inequities. They are not inevitable. Things can, in fact, improve. Inequity in healthcare is not our destiny, I believe. Equity is. When organizations we have collaborated with recognize inequities or undesired variation, they make equity a strategic priority. They understand the history of inequities in their system and take those first steps to making improvement, the result can be dramatic. One of our partners early on was the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. They began with an effort to reduce disparities in congestive heart failure, led by the two people you see on screen, Drs. Michelle Morris and Braun Lispelway. It was not easy going in the beginning, it still is not. But as Michelle and Braun began to make progress, it ignited something in people. It ignited a movement across all clinical departments at the Brigham from anesthesiology to urology. There are now over 20 clinical departments who are looking at their data, finding inequities, and taking the needed steps to start addressing them. In his last public address here in the US before he was assassinated, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. described the dynamics of the racial justice movement here in the US. And he said, that there was a certain kind of fire that no water could ever put out. And that's exactly what's happening in these hospitals and in the minds of these clinicians. When I speak with Brahm and Michelle, Kene, Fran, Claudia, they cannot unsee what they have seen. They cannot countenance the inequalities that are occurring on their watch. They see not only the injustice, but also a very practical way that our work on quality can eliminate those inequities. They have, they have now deep inside them a certain kind of fire that no water can put out. And this fire has animated our colleagues, nurses, doctors, quality experts, patients, stimulating and motivating them because we are finally working towards fulfilling our foundational professional duties, our oaths to heal and be healers. It reminds me of the early days of patient safety when we when work to reduce harm felt like a breath of fresh air because we were finally able to admit transparently and openly that unsafe care events were actually happening in our care environments. And then we could apply ourselves to the task of eliminating harm wherever we could find it. And this is the point that draws us back to the concept of moral injury. This work on equity, this fire that no water can ever put out lives in the hearts of so many of us. Our collective failure to address these social inequities Claudia wrote, left her feeling powerless. But just as well, our ability to seize control of these inequities, to eliminate them wherever we can find them, can help us, I think, feel powerful once again. I've seen it. For the past five years, IHI has worked with dozens of health systems committed to pursuing health equity all across the world, really. These amazingly successful programs have been incredible. But the time we believe at IHI has come for a system-wide approach, not just the providers and health system actors, not just the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, technicians, and others, but we need payment to align. We need regulation to align. We need commissioning to align. We need the pharmaceutical companies and professional societies and others to come alongside one another to align our activities to reach the kind of scale we need to make a whole the whole ecosystem of healthcare more equitable. And it's for that reason that we've joined hands with the American Medical Association in my country, Race Board, the Groundwater Institute, the American Hospital Association to create a national coalition that we, cre that we call the Rise to Health Coalition, which is aiming to end health inequity in healthcare. This is an American coalition, but it need not be an American coalition. There could be an international version of this. could There could be a rise to health in your country. And in fact, at the National Forum at IHI, uh, just yesterday and the day before, as I announced this coalition, I could see already in countries throughout the world the start of similar ideas. How can we create a rise to health 
in the UK? How can we create a rise to health in Scotland? How can we create a rise to health in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa? How do we do that in Brazil? It was thrilling to imagine the stakeholders will be different. The, the partners will change, but the idea of doing this can be, we can do this together. In Rise to Health, we have two primary goals, to take action and change stories. Imagine the impact if we got a thousand hospitals, which is about 20% of all American hospitals, our nation's leading insurers, all pharmaceutical companies, professional societies, over a hundred thousand clinicians, all committing to a series of evidence-based actions that can improve equity and transform healthcare. For health systems, we've defined five specific changes. Make equity a part of your strategy. Get grounded in your local community's history. Look at your data to identify where your biggest clinical, clinical inequities lie and begin to take action using quality improvement methods while partnering with your community to guide and support those efforts. The other actors, payers, pharmaceutical companies, professional societies, many of the changes will be similar to these. Over the last two years, IHI has collaborated with one such pair, Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts, on an example of the kind of cross-industry partnership that we think is going to be necessary to help us. We help BCBS collect gold standard data, uh, stratify and transparently report inequities, and then support their providers with technical assistance and grant funding to kickstart equity improvement initiatives. Providers, hospitals and health systems across the state of Massachusetts have responded launching efforts on diabetes care, on cancer care, on cardiovascular care. Soon, Blue Cross in Massachusetts will start a thoughtfully designed pay for equity program. They will actually start to pay providers differently based on whether they are addressing inequities. And this will create, I believe, a durable financial case, a business case for equity for the long haul. There are many on ramps to join the Rise to Health Coalition. One of them is the Pursuing Equity Learning and Action Network. This is an action community which begins in January. And we put out a call to action for 40 teams. We got more than 70, and we've accepted them all into this community of health system actors who are gonna be working on equity together. There are other ways to join us. Here on the slide right now is a QR code. If you have a moment, please go to this. Uh, we'd love to have you join us. This is, there are ways to join with the American Medical Association, with IHI. If you're looking to get started as a healthcare professional, IHI's open school, and AMAs, the American Medical Association Center for Health Equity, offer numerous free credit-bearing courses on health equity, anti-racism, and advancing equity through quality and safety methods and practices. Take one of these courses. Find a few colleagues to share the experience with. I promise you it will change your perspective on what we need to change and how we need to change it. But beyond this, the specifics of what health systems, payers, professional societies, and others will do, I think that what the bigger opportunity is in all of this is the idea of changing the story. Changing the story of health inequities from one of despair and analysis paralysis to one of hope, possibility, and transformative collaboration. Let me stop now with one last notion here. And it comes, uh, it's my belief that our work on equity will have the restorative and regenerative effect of helping us heal the health professions. At IHI, we have a saying that goes, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. If we want a different result, one that honors the brilliance and contributions of dedicated clinicians, like you've heard about today, like Claudia, like Fran, like Kene, like my father, and so many others, we must change the system. And as it turns out, the only people who are capable of restoring trust in our systems, ending the epidemic of moral injury, creating lasting health equity are all of us. Earlier this year at a IHI Leadership Alliance, a, a physician from Maine, Dr. Navneet Marwaha, noted the long road ahead of us. And she said, just remember that you are entirely up to you. And by the end of our few days together, everyone was quoting this moment and this, this notion of we, you are entirely up to you. But as with all good IHI meetings, we had added something. You are entirely up to you, yes. And we are entirely up to us. So thank you. I hope you'll consider joining Rise to Health or starting one of your own in your environments. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Kedar. And that exceeded expectations. You've managed to inform, 
inspire, move um, and motivate us whilst at the same time providing so many practical tips about things we can do moving forward. So I'm going to turn now to our guest questioner who is Richard McCrory. He is a specialty doctor in renal medicine from the Ulster Hospital in Belfast. Richard, over to you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Kedar, that was a very emotive talk, actually. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. It's given a lot to ponder. Um, my question is about dignity. Um, the IHI has helped healthcare systems deliver dignity as an essential component of patient-centered care. And I think uh, you've tied that in very much so in, in your talk. But workplace dignity remains an underexplored aspect of healthcare organizations. So in your view, what practical steps could be made to push the workplace dignity agenda and what can organizations, departments and individuals provide to enable healthcare workers to find dignity in their work? Well, thank you so much, uh, Richard, for that question. And uh, I really think this is a, an, a really incredibly important time for us to think about how to restore dignity to the work environment. Um, I think it ties in very much so to this notion of moral injury. Uh, of course, you can you would imagine me saying that having just heard me for the last uh, few minutes here, but I am quite confident that what we're experiencing in the clinical environments today is the inability for us to do the things that we had imagined doing. And that creates a loss of agency, a loss of purpose to some extent, and a sentiment that we are uh, uh, being treated unfairly in the environment. I think to restore dignity begins with asking ourselves a, a question that we've been talking about at IHI for a long time. Uh, we've been talking about it from the perspective of our, our patients. We've been saying we have to ask our patients not what's the matter with you, but what matters to you. And that idea will help us become more patient-centered. But let's turn that now for a moment and use the same concept uh, with the workforce and say, what matters to you, staff? What, what matters to you, staff nurse? What matters to you, staff pharmacist or, or, or doctor? Uh, when we start to ask ourselves what matters to you um, at the amongst our clinicians, we have the opportunity to understand what's important, what truly creates joy and meaning and purpose in the work environment. And if we can create conditions that then enable that, we're starting to do what is necessary to restore dignity to our care and work environments. So from my perspective, that's how it begins. That's why IHI's joy and work framework uh, begins with the notion of asking what matters to you, to the staff, and then extends from there to detecting what are some of the critical challenges that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis, what we call the pebbles in our shoes, those little uh, minor irritations that compound themselves over time and, and erode our confidence, erode our abilities and, and, and frustrate us. And then to use disciplined improvement science to try to reduce those kinds of challenges and, and eradicate them. That's the essence in, in a nutshell of what the IHI Joy and Work Framework is. And we're finding now across 17 nations that are now implementing the JOY framework that it's creating a deeper connection to, to, the, work, to the workplace, it's creating more meaning, it's creating uh, uh, more joy and restoring dignity in the work environment. Thank you. That was a great answer to that question. Um, so just to remind our audience, we do have the ability for you to submit questions. We've got quite a few already um, and we've got about another seven minutes for this. So please do feel free to submit more. But what would be really helpful as well is if you could like uh, those that are already there that you particularly want to see asked. It just helps me to know uh, where the audience uh, preferences are, though I will reserve chair's prerogative if I see a question um, that looks particularly pertinent and has only just come in. So Kedar, the, the one that's had the most votes, I think you've already answered this throughout the presentation actually, but I think it's interesting that it's th this is where folk are really wanting to hear more, which is around how best the healthcare workers 
at the front line on the shop floor can begin to address the challenges brought about by health inequality. And, and I think particularly where folk are working in a context where maybe there isn't an organisational recognition of the importance of these issues. So I just wonder if is there anything more you would want to say in terms of advice to those individuals? Yeah, for, first of all, I think that so right. So the two ways of answering this question. One is take one of those courses. I think it, I mean, I cannot tell you how important it is for us to get smarter about our unconscious biases. You know, make the invisible visible, as my uh, good friend Atul Gawande uh, once said to me, you know, by taking one of these courses on on uh, on unconscious bias, you raise or bring into your consciousness the biases that you might be exhibiting as a provider or as a clinician things that you think you are not doing. <laughs> Frankly, things that I thought I wasn't doing, right? I'm, as I'm here talking to you about this issue, and I know for a fact that, because I because I have my data from my hospital medicine department about the issues that I have with respect to under-treating pain, uh, with respect to differentially discharging patients to home versus rehab uh, uh, among different populations. It, raising to your understanding the fact that these things can uh, are part of our history, are part of our locality, uh, your issues will be different, but but uh, but becoming aware of them is incredibly important. So training and and developing that training not just as an individual, but do it together with uh, a few a few colleagues and friends, so you can discuss these things together because that creates a community. And it, you need this is not the kind of thing that you can do in isolation. It needs teamwork, uh, just like um, learning uh, kidney biology needed teamwork for me when I was in medical school. Uh, so this is that kind of thing. The second thing I would say is uh, pick a measure that matters to you. How do you judge your success as a clinician? Uh, for me, as a hospital medicine physician, I judge uh, the return to hospital. I judge my performance as how many of my patients did I send into the community that have to come back to the hospital for whatever, for the original presenting signs and symptoms that they admitted were admitted with. Take whatever measure matters to you and do your own data collection. Do not wait for business intelligence or your local IT team or whoever you're trying to figure out how to work with, because I know those uh, people are busy and it will take you forever and you'll never get the data back. But do it on your on your own team. Uh, pick a measure that matters. Start capturing information about that measure that you can collect. Um, ask your patients how they self-identify by race, ethnicity, language, language, disability status, sexual orientation, gender identity. You can ask them yourself and then start to uh, identify where there might be uh, opportunities to make improvements. So it's a very local version of the story. Start by understanding, increasing your understanding, pick a measure that you judge yourself by, and then collect data on, a, on your own time, essentially in a spreadsheet or on a piece of paper in your office about whether you're seeing people, in my case, whether I'm seeing people of different backgrounds come back to the hospital more regularly. So those are practical ways that you can get started on this. Once you see disparities in your practice, I have the utmost confidence in clinicians that you will take action because that is our nature uh, as clinicians. We, we cannot unsee when we see these things that are taking place in our environments. Thank you. Um, and we're going to jump from that very practical question to a, a kind of a, a bigger system one now that's coming from Isioma Okolo. Um, apologies if I've not quite said that right. Uh, so they're highlighting that between 7 to 70 to 80 percent of health outcomes are impacted by the socio-economic geopolitical determinants and we know don't we, that in medical care impacts about 10 to 20 percent of health outcomes so the gist of the question is for individuals working in acute hospitals where they know that the majority of out impact on outcomes is going to be the 70 to 80 percent in social determinants what what can they do because it can feel beyond the scope of practice of somebody working in an acute hospital and they're saying it sometimes feels a bit helpless and a waste of resources patching over cracks in an acute setting and not contributing to root cause prevention level work so any reflections on that yeah first of all thank you for the uh for, for the question, and I get this question a lot, actually. Uh, it's not uncommon, and, and, the, and the questioner is right that so much of what determines our health has nothing to do with hospital care. However, I always have this sort of gut reaction to this question, because when, when you are facing a metastatic cancer, 
or a, a trauma or have a stroke or have a heart attack. In that case, your social determinants and your pre-existing health conditions do not determine your outcome, actually. What takes place in the hospital determines the outcome in those settings. What determined outcome for Shalon had everything to do with what took place in the hospital and in, this, in the care setting. The stroke care uh, uh, variation that I showed you, that 20, the 70 percent difference between black and white outcome, that has everything to do what we do with what we do in the hospital. So there is a lot that we can do to reduce inequities in what we do inside of our hospitals that have direct uh, relationship to the health outcome for the patients that come through our doors in acute care. That said, I agree with the questioner's premise that there's a lot that we need to do or we must do or we must think about how to do in the ambulatory outpatient upstream and preventative side of the effort. To me, this is not an either or choice. This is a both and choice and it depends on where you sit in the system. So if you happen to work more on the preventive side or in the ambulatory side or on the uh, primary care side, then you're going to be wanting to work on things uh, in your environment, disparities and causes and more root cause type activity that work in that area. If you're in the hospital, in the acute care side, as the questioner was, I think, intimating, I still believe that there are uh, plenty of important inequities that drive adverse outcomes as a result of what we do inside of acute care institutions. So it's not uh, fruitless to work on inequities in those environments because you will say, I'm sure of it, I've seen it in multiple occasions. I showed you examples of it, multiple, many, many, many lives. Great, thank you. And I'm going to sneak one more question in um, from our, our friend in Scotland, and I think yours in IHI as well, um, David Grayson. Hi, David. Lovely to hear from you. Um, and he is highlighting that Amartya Sen believes that our shared experience of the pandemic can help us overcome moral injury, but we need good policies in place to guide us. So what do you believe, Kedar, are the key policies we need to address inequity? Well, I'm very heartened actually by the fact, thanks, it's nice to hear from you, David, as well. Uh, it's, it's a great question, and I think every country is grappling with this question in slightly different ways. It's nice to see, or very good to see, how much how much emphasis policymakers in many countries are now placing on questions of inequity. Uh, I think the, the 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 bottom line is I think that historically we have we have treated um, this as with a misunderstanding of the of the way in which inequities come about. We've we've had this notion, especially in my co country, the dominant narrative has been treat everyone the same, and everyone will have an opportunity to prosper off of an even platform. But they're starting, as you know, from an uneven starting point. And that uneven starting point means that some people will get ahead and some people won't. So this idea of leveling that playing field, not by reducing the has, but by improving uh, the lot of those that have not for many years, is I think the way, is the general principle of all of the restorative and reparative policies that are, are needed right now. So I'm, I'm talking a little bit quickly here, but what I'm trying to say is that in essence, we've moved from an equality-based notion of policymaking to an equity-based way of making policy, which is about more deeply understanding why certain communities have been you know, under-resourced and left behind and have therefore received in, or, or, or experiencing inequitable out outcomes in care. And the, the way that policy needs to be constructed now is in a manner that actually more in a more targeted way creates opportunity and brings resources to those populations that have been historically disenfranchised and under-resourced. That's, I think, what's going to help us bring about the kind of change that we need to bring about the kind of equity that we're trying to create. Thank you so much, and I'm so sorry that we've run out of time. There was so much in that response alone, it would have been interesting to unpack further. Thank you. Mm. Um, just before we finish up to highlight, we are joined next time in January by Dr. Stephen Shorrock. So this is our third attempt at trying to hear from Stephen. Unfortunately, the first time we cancelled him because it was at a peak of a COVID wave in Scotland and our system was under enormous pressure. And the next time um, we cancelled him because we were in an official mourning period for the, the death of our Queen. So um, this is our third attempt in January. We're hoping third time lucky. 
And please note that if you registered for the previous session in September, you will need to register again. Really sorry about this, uh, but due to a change in our privacy policy, we've had to change our provider around registration. So please do sign up again to hear from Stephen. Um, it'll be worth the wait, I promise you that. And finally, just to say and remind everyone that the rest of our back catalogue is available for you to watch and enjoy on our website. And of course, you can watch this one again as well. Uh, there was so much in it, it will be one definitely worth watching through again. Um, you can also visit our QI Connect YouTube channel. So it just remains for me to say thank you to all of you for joining. And I do hope that we'll see you again in January and um, have a good festive season. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. It's nice to be with you.